Hi, I'm William Spaniel. This video is a presentation that I will be giving at the University of Rochester in a week for Professor Bethany Lucina's class, uh, Civil War in the International System, it's IR slash PSC 265. Um, I'm filming this for two reasons. First, for the students of that class, this can be used as a secondary study guide in case you miss something during the lecture, or of course, if you miss lecture entirely, you can access this video and go through it and I'll touch on everything that I do in that actual lecture. And then secondly, of course, if you are not at the University of Rochester, you can enjoy this video for free based on the power of YouTube and get a world-class education even if you aren't anywhere near upstate New York. So the title of this lecture is Commitment Problems in Civil Conflict. So in this lecture, I'll be discussing a game theoretical mechanism that we call a commitment problem and how it leads to civil conflict or civil war. And our goals for this lecture are as follows. There's three things that I want you to be able to do by the time that this lecture ends. First, I want you to be able to define what a commitment problem is uh, from the game theoretical framework. Secondly, I want you to be able to explain why commitment problems cause civil wars to start. And similarly, I want you to be able to explain why commitment problems make civil wars difficult to end. So it's going to be the same underlying mechanism, this thing that we call a commitment problem, but there's going to be two different flavors that we're going to apply it to uh, in this first case here and the second case here, numbers two and three. So I want you to be able to understand what a commitment problem is, but then understand the subtle distinction between two and three. So let's get to it. Let's start with defining what a commitment problem is. And to introduce this, well, there's a story that I like to tell. It's about, uh, well, something that happened to me two years ago. So as I was moving from San Diego, California to Rochester, I grew up in Southern California. And well, I wanted to go to a PhD program. I chose to come to Rochester, New York, which is where I am here on this side of the country. If you imagine that this is a poorly drawn, in fact, absent map of the United States. Basically, I needed to get myself from point A to point B. And well, I needed everything that I owned with me um, in California to come with me to Rochester, New York, including my car. And so I decided to pack everything that I own pretty much into the back seat in the trunk of my car and well, put it all in there and start driving to Rochester, New York. I, of course, put a blanket over my back seat so that the prying eyes of a thief wouldn't actually see that I had everything in there. Um, it was a poorly uh, designed idea to try to ward away a thief. But given the fact that this is such a long trip and given how I am a huge baseball fan, when I found out that the Angels, which is my baseball team, would be playing in Arlington, Texas, which is roughly here, I decided instead of going straight from point A to point B to go through Arlington from here to here and then here to here. And this did cause a little bit of fear in me. I thought that there was a small, maybe a large degree, who knows, of a chance that as I was driving through Texas, my car would be profiled for its California license plate and I would just be randomly pulled over. And as it turned out, I got no further than El Paso, which is here, which is right next to New Mexico. It's right across the border from New Mexico and also across, uh, right across the international border with the country of Mexico, very close uh, to, to New Mexico, like I said. So just after I got into the state of Texas, I got pulled over in El Paso. I was driving past a police car, the first police car that I saw on the freeway. Um, I saw them look over to me. I I saw them look in my back seat and immediately as soon as I passed them the lights came on and I, I pulled over and when I pulled over the ranger said basically to me your car is full of stuff covered with a blanket uh, you must be a drug dealer so I'm gonna search your vehicle now and well that kind of shocked me and I told him uh, well heck no uh, I've asked them if you knew the difference between a legal search and an illegal search and well it appeared that he didn't because what he was demanding of me was completely illicit and that he had no legal right to commit such a search without my consent and I definitely wasn't going to give him my consent to that because I didn't want him to go through all my belongings there's just a ton of stuff in my car pretty much everything I owned it would take forever to go through it and he responded to me by well he said this he said that I can either let him do a quick search or we could wait a half an hour for a canine unit to arrive from the nearest station, which was, I guess, 30 minutes away. And he said, well, look, it's hot out here. We could either 
wait all of that time or we could just you know get through it very quickly do a quick search and really the quick search would be better for both of us because we wouldn't have to stand in the hot sun for that 30 minutes just waiting for the dog to arrive now i want you to think excuse me for a moment as my microphone came off um, i want you to think about what you would do in that situation just for a second stop think about it would you allow the officer to search your vehicle at this point or not well, I'm going to make the argument that you definitely shouldn't because I told him, uh, well, am I going to trust you? No way. I'll wait. Thank you very much. And the reason for this is I thought it out in my head how this would work out. And this is, in fact, an example of a commitment problem, which is why I'm introducing it to you now and why I'm telling you this entire story. So let's think about the strategic interaction here, just in terms of the moves and the order the people make it. So really, this game starts with me uh, allowing a search or waiting for the canine unit to arrive. If I wait for the canine unit to arrive, the officer has to wait. He can't search my vehicle because he does not have my permission and it would be illegal for uh, that uh, to be done and so he definitely wouldn't do it we would essentially just be waiting for the canine um, if i waited if i chose to wait for the canine alternatively i could allow a search to happen and the ranger at that point could do two things he could conduct a quick little search and you know just go around the vehicle maybe peer under the blanket see what's under there or he could do a thorough search which would mean you know uh well not only lifting up the blanket but also him going through all of my stuff uh there which was like i said it was everything i owned so it was quite dense now, the way we go about solving this sort of game in, in game theory is to associate payoffs for each of these outcomes and then work through what each player should do in response to what the other player would do. So let's take this one step at a time. Let's look at the payoffs. So I'm going to add numbers here. These numbers correspond to each of the player's uh, pr most preferred outcomes to least preferred outcomes, where the larger numbers represent the more preferred outcomes, the smaller numbers represent the lesser preferred outcomes. So the blue numbers represent my payoffs. My best outcome here is for the ranger to conduct just a quick little search, because I don't want to be waiting in the half, waiting in the sun for half an hour like the officer said, that would be bad. So if, if I could get a quick search, well, that would be my best possible outcome. What I really don't want, though, is for the ranger to conduct a thorough search because, well, it would take forever. It would take much longer than waiting a half an hour for the dog to arrive. And, you know, who knows how much damage would be done to all of that stuff in my vehicle. He's obviously not going to be uh, too interested if he thinks that I am a drug dealer in preserving all of my, my stuff in a pleasant state. He will be more concerned with actually searching the vehicle. So I don't really want that outcome. That would be my worst outcome. And of course, in the middle is waiting for the canine unit to arrive. Alternatively, the ranger's most preferred outcome is to do this thorough search, because if I am a bad person, the thorough search is what's going to actually allow him to verify that I am a bad person, or alternatively, that I'm not a bad person. Uh, but if you can't have a thorough search, then he doesn't want to wait in this hot sun for a long time. So he'd rather get a quick search out of the way um, and, and get on with his life. And, you know, that will give him roughly the same amount of access that the dog would, but it would be much quicker for him to do that. And so, well, how do you solve this game? You have to work backwards. So you think about what would happen in the future and then work your way backward from it. So let's look at this from the perspective of the ranger. Suppose I allowed a search to happen. That means the ranger has to decide between a quick search and a thorough search. And if we isolate his payoffs here, we see that a thorough search gives him three, a quick search gives him two. So we can see that if the ranger were to ever be in this position, if I were to ever allow a search to occur, the ranger would want to conduct a thorough search rather than the quick search. And, you know, that's, that's just straightforward there based off of the payoffs, based upon his own preferences. That's what he would want to do if ever given the opportunity. So what we'll do here is we'll just erase this quick search from existence because we know that if I allow a search, that the ranger will go for the thorough search. And we use that information to, to think about what I should do, what my best response is, knowing that he will in the future conduct a thorough search. And so if we bring back this wait for canine option and we highlight my payoffs, we see that if I wait for a canine, I get two. If I uh, allow a search to happen, then the ranger will conduct a thorough search and I'll get one. This two is greater than this one. I should wait for the canine unit to arrive. And so my optimal strategy and the outcome of this game is for me to just simply wait for the canine unit to arrive and that's it. That's, that's the game. Game, we wait 30 minutes for that dog to arrive. Now, 
You'll notice, and if you'll recall back to what the officer said, the officer said that it would be worse for both of us to wait for the canine unit to arrive. That 30 minutes in the hot sun would be worse for both of us than for allowing him to conduct a quick search of my vehicle. And in fact, he was telling, him, telling me the truth there. If we look at the payoffs here, this outcome is better for both of us than this outcome is. This three is better than this two for me, and this two is better for him than this one is here. The problem is that the ranger can't credibly commit to conducting a quick search. Once I authorize a search, I can't really control what type of uh, search the ranger does. Legally, I've sort of waived my right to say, hey, that's not a quick search. You said that you would only do a quick search. I basically waive my right at that point. I allow the ranger to do whatever he wants, and we see here, as we saw before, that the ranger would want to conduct a thorough search at that point rather than the quick search. And so instead of getting this mutually better outcome, because the ranger can't credibly commit to conducting this quick search because we know that he's going to conduct a thorough search if given the opportunity, instead we're both stuck with this inferior outcome, this wait for canine outcome, which gives me two and him one rather than me getting three and him getting two. So what is a commitment problem? Well, in the time inconsistency issue, which is what we're looking here, you need to have two elements to get to this commitment problem. First, there needs to exist an outcome that is better for both parties than the outcome that actually occurs. And so we just saw that. We've been seeing that over and over and over again. This outcome is better for both of us than this outcome. So condition one is fulfilled there. And then secondly, we need this to also happen. We need it for it that if one player could credibly commit to a certain action in the future, that the players would be able to reach the mutually preferable outcome. So essentially, if the ranger were to be able to erase this thorough search from existence to say, hey, this will never happen. I can't possibly do this. I'm just physically incapable of conducting a thorough search. If the ranger could somehow commit to that actually being the case, that we could actually coordinate on this better outcome. But because we can't, well, you know, we're stuck with this worse outcome. So the second part is what we specifically refer to as the time inconsistency of the preferences. So at the beginning of the game, the, the ranger wants to say, hey, I, I don't want to do this other search. I don't want to do this thorough search. I want to do this quick search. But when it actually gets time for him to choose what type of search he wants to do, that he's going to conduct this other search, the search that he promised not to do. So that takes care of the first part of this lecture's goals, which was to define what a commitment problem is. Now we're moving on to explaining why commitment problems cause civil wars to start. I'm actually going to use a case study of the breakup of Yugoslavia. So if we start back, way back to World War II, the Nazis actually occupied Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is predominantly Serbian. That's the largest ethnic group, but there's tons of smaller ethnic groups in the region, one of which is the Croatians. And the Nazis during World War II used a divide and conquer type of strategy where they put the Croatians in charge. This is a common thing that you'll see throughout history. If an invading power or a colonial power tries to take over a region of the world, that they'll put an ethnic minority in charge that sort of relies on the larger country, the invading country, for their support. And thus the invader, in this case the Nazis, can trust that the Croatians will sort of do the Nazis' bidding because, well, the Nazis are the ones that are propping up the Croatians in power, and if the Croatians were ever to try to do things differently, the Nazis would kick them out of power, and the Croatians would go back to their disenfranchised state as the ethnic minority in Yugoslavia. So they use, utilize this divide and conquer strategy. The power, the Croatian power that came into the Croatian government that should, I should say, I'm going to pause, try this again. The Croatian government that came into power was called the Ustashe. Um, like I said, the Yugoslavia's largest eth ethnic groups were the Serbians, but the Nazis propped up a Croatian government, which we call the Ustashe. And the Ustashe actually committed a lot of atrocities against the Serbs. And uh, there's actually a knife that they developed. So if, think about this, try to pretend that you're a completely sadistic person and you want to try to kill as many people as efficiently as possible with just a single blade. If you keep using a knife and holding that knife in your hand, your hand is going to eventually grow tired. And so they developed a, a wristband that they would put around their arm, around their wrist, 
so that instead of having to hold the blade taut with their hand, they could just use their entire arm for their slashing motion, which is less tiring and less straining on your muscles than having to clench your fist against the blade the entire time. And they used this device to slaughter Serbs, these Croatians did. And it's important to note that the Eustache's logo resembles the logo on the Croatian flag currently. If you don't know what that looks like, you can look it up on Wikipedia very quickly and, and see what that is. This will come back in a second. It's very important that we mention that here, though. So hold that thought in your memory for just one second. And let's talk about the Cold War in Yugoslavia. So World War II ends, the Nazis get expelled from everywhere, and uh, in the Nazis' place, a guy named Tito rises to power under a, a communist government. And during the time that Tito is in charge of Yugoslavia, there's relative ethnic peace in the country. And actually, there's this really cheery motto that they had back during that time that Yugoslavia has seven neighbors, six republics, five nations, four languages, three religions, two scripts, and one goal to live in brotherhood and unity. So you definitely get this communist uh, ideological flavor to this to this motto that, you know, we have all of these differences, we're tons of different languages, tons of different nations, tons of different republics, but we all have this common unity, this brotherhood, which is, you know, communism. But, you know, whatever. During the time, give credit to Tito, despite the fact that, you know, communism is not really very much fun, there was relative ethnic peace um, in Yugoslavia, and actually uh, interracial marriages were on the rise during this time. People, uh, Croatian people were marrying Serbian people um, in numbers that were just increasingly large and, and not, had not been seen before in that region. But that being said, Tito dies in 1980 and the communist government slowly unravels. Eventually, uh, within 10 years, republics begin breaking away, forming their own governments and democratizing. And in particular, uh, Croatia goes into transition. So Croatia gains independence in 1991 and holds democratic elections. And so this guy named Tujman runs on a nationalist platform and wins those elections. So he's a very popular Croatian nationalist, wins the elections, and well, guess what he does? He, he reintroduces the Croatian logo, slightly different from what the Ustache had, but very much similar to, to that old logo. So, well, that seems like a bad thing, right? It seems like we're lighting a powder keg here. And in fact, that's, that's exactly what ended up occurring. So the Croatian government places these patches on the police uniforms and the Serbian police in Croatia aren't very happy about this. So although Croatia, the, the region of Croatia, which is now the country of Croatia, um, is largely a majority Croatian, it's not to say that it's entirely Croatian, right? There's pockets of ethnic minorities scattered throughout the country. Some of these guys are Serbians, some of them serve in the Croatian police. And, you know, you can think about just how bad this is. If, if you're a Serbian and you're sensitive to these atrocities that occurred uh, about 45 years ago, well, you're not gonna very much like having this logo on your patch on your police uniform. And so what happens? Well, the Serbs in Croatia declare their own independence. Now, <laughs> How does this relate back to the commitment problem? Well, you can think of it like this. We're not gonna associate payoffs. We're just gonna think about this as much in the abstract as possible. We just wanna think about the different moves that they have, that these two ethnic groups, the Serbs and the Croats have within the country of Croatia, and think about what each of these countries or each of these groups would most like to do given what's going to happen um, otherwise. So. When Croatia gets into when when Croatia first declares independence, when you first declare independence as a country, things are sort of chaotic, right? Croatia was not the big bad dude on the block in Yugoslavia. That was Serbia. Serbia was the the center of government and the center of the military, and they really held all of the physical military power in Yugoslavia at the time. So, although Serbia didn't interfere directly uh, with the Croatian independence, at least not to the extent that we're going to see in a second. Um, you was, or sorry, uh, Croatia did not have a ton of military power. They were relatively enfeebled at the time. So the Serbians, the ethnic Ser Serbians in Croatia could do two things. They could first uprise right now, declare independence, start a civil war, ask the, uh, the Serbians in their own country of Serbia for help, remembering that the Serbians in Serbia are strong and powerful at the time, or they could wait and see. 
they could see and hope that in the future that the Croatian government will not um, just do bad things to the Ser ethnic Serbians in Croatia. Now, there's a problem if the Serbians wait and see. So if the Croatians in the future are nice, then the Serbians are happy. That's sort of their ideal outcome. That, to reference the example before where we were talking about me getting searched in my traveling through Texas, um, that would be associated with my best outcome, which was for the police officer to conduct a quick search. But there's a question here whether the Croatians in the future will actually be nice or be not so nice. If time passes, if the Serbs wait for the Croatians to get settled, well, here's the thing. The Croatians will be much more powerful then. They've actually had time to organize themselves, to develop their own military. Essentially, if we're going to rebel, if we as Serbs are going to rebel, because the Croatians may not be nice to us in the future, if rebelling is what's going to happen, we would rather uprise now than later. Essentially, we should be uprising while the Croatian government is weak and enfeebled and not wait for them to get themselves settled and to grow stronger. And so if you assume that the Croatians later in the future are going to not be so nice to these Serbs, which, you know, given the fact that we had this um, ethnically charged election that a, a nationalist candidate won, it's not so unreasonable to believe that in the future Croatians are not going to be so nice to the Serbians, well, that the Serbians should uprise now. So if, if essentially what happens here is that we see that the Croatians are going to not be so, be so nice in the future, then rather than having the Serbians wait and see what's going to happen and for the Croatians to be not so nice, the Serbs should just uprise now and that should be our outcome, essentially a civil war. We should start a civil war for the Serbians in the newly independent Croatia. And of course, this is an inferior outcome for both parties. It would really be better if the Croats in the future were to be nice to the, to the Serbians rather than ending up in this war outcome here where the Serbians uprise and the Croatians can't do a thing. They can't, uh, they can't be nice in the future because the Serbs aren't even giving them the opportunity. But of course, if the Serbs were to wait and see in the future, then, well, the Croatians don't actually necessarily want to be nice in the future, and they might be not so nice, and, well, that's just worse for the Serbs. So despite the fact that there's an outcome that both the Serbs and the Croatians theoretically should prefer to this uprising outcome, the fact that the Croatians can't credibly commit to being nice in the future causes the Serbs to uprise in the present. So that takes care of our second goal, explaining why commitment problems cause civil wars to start. And now finally, we want to explain why commitment problems make civil wars difficult to end. And to give you a, a reason why we should care about this sort of thing, let's talk about war termination. You can think of two different types of wars. You can think of interstate wars between, fought between two different countries. So for example, the United States fighting Iraq. And you can think of a civil war. So a civil war would be the United States in the 1860s when the North fought the South, or today in Iraq where the Sunnis are fighting the Shiite. Um, so two different kinds of conflict. And there is an imperial, empirical puzzle uh, given this dichotomy of wars, these interstate wars versus these civil wars. So in almost two-thirds of inter interstate wars, almost two-thirds of interstate wars end in a negotiated settlement. That is, the sides don't fight all the way until one side has completely militarily defeated the other. They fight for a while, they learn a little bit more about each other, they see how each other are, or how much the other side is committed to the fight, they see the types of the extent of, of casualties each side is willing to endure, they also see how equipped the other side is to fight, how powerful they are. They learn about each other and then they take this new information that they gathered and they sit down at the bargaining table and they iron out an agreement. And this happens two-thirds of the time. So. Um, well, that point is just saying what I basically just said, that as fighting continues, the sides learn about each other. This allows them to, to gather more information, and that uh, extra information allows them to settle and to come to agreements they couldn't do before the war started. Now, in contrast, less than a fifth of civil wars end in a negotiated settlement. So there's a huge difference there, right? So two-thirds of the time, about two-thirds of the time, uh, interstate wars are negotiated, 
uh, or the settlement is negotiated, but in less than a fifth of the civil wars, there's the negotiation. So in more than four fifths of those civil wars, they keep fighting and fighting and fighting until one side has completely demolished the other side and can reign triumphant. So, you know, a couple of questions here. What accounts for that difference? Why is it that interstate wars are more likely to be settled than civil wars? And what makes the 20% of civil wars special from the other 80%? So why are very few of these civil wars actually resolved? What causes them to be resolved in a peaceful manner than in comparison to the remaining 80% of the wars that are fought until one side has just been militarily defeated, completely destroyed? So let's take one. Uh, let's take each of these questions one at a time. First, let's talk about what accounts for the difference. Obviously, my answer here is going to be commitment problems. So let's look at this from the perspective of a losing side and a winning side in the middle of a civil war. So it might be fairly clear that the losing side is going to lose. They could possibly, well, a miracle could happen. There's some slight chance that they'll be able to overcome uh, the military obstacles that that are currently in front of them, um, but that's unlikely. What's much more likely is the winning side is going to trounce them if they continue fighting. Alternatively, they could surrender. Uh, the winning side might offer, say, hey, well, you know, losing side, we don't want to continue fighting because fighting is killing both of our people, so here's the deal. If you just lay down your arms, will forgive you for what you did to the state. You know, um, yeah, you rebelled against us, and yeah, we didn't like that very much, but in exchange for you being so kind as to uh, lay down your arms, rather than executing you for treason, we'll forgive and forget. So if we map it out like this, the losing side begins by praying for a miracle and continuing to fight and seeing what happens, or they surrender and the winning side chooses whether to forgive or execute for treason. Now you can see how this is going to be a pretty big problem here. So imagine that the uh, the losing side decided to surrender and imagine you're the winning side so let's just let's get rid of these two things let's delete them let's pretend that they don't exist so the losing side surrenders imagine the perspective of the winning side what's the winning side going to do is the winning side really going to forgive the losing side at this point or are they going to execute them for treason so the losing side has given up their entire military power right they've surrendered they don't have the guns anymore What's the winning side going to do? Well, do they have any reason to forgive the losing side anymore? Not really. The losing side uh, was offered forgiveness purely to give up their arms. The winning side wanted to lure the winning side, you know, dangle an apple or a carrot in front of the losing side by saying, we'll forgive you if you just surrender now. But once the losing side has surrendered, the purpose of dangling that carrot has gone away because the losing side no longer has its military power. If the winning side decides to to switch uh, uh, their their uh, their their commitment, to said, "Well, you know, we we we're going to forgive you originally, but you know, now we're going to execute you for treason." The losing side can't really do anything about that. They don't have any guns. They'll essentially be like, "No, don't do it," and the winning side is going to shoot them anyway. And there's nothing the losing side can do. And you know, given the bad blood that has been running through the two sides for as long as it has, it's pretty safe to say that the winning side is almost certainly going to execute the losing side's leaders for treason. So what does that mean? Well, if the losing side knows that if they surrender, the winning side is going to execute its leaders for treason, that the losing side is going to pray for a miracle and hope that the winning side uh, will just, you know, somehow flounder on the battlefield and the losing side will go back and and be the strong side and, and be in uh, the dominant position and you know hopefully they'll be able to to fight and win the war at that point that's going to be a lot better uh, than certain death if they surrender and let the winning side execute them for treason so well what's the outcome the losing side prays for a miracle and no surrender ever occurs of course this is a commitment problem. Why? Because this other outcome here, where the losing side surrenders and the winning side forgives, that's going to be better for both parties. Uh, on average, they'll be getting the same outcome here as they will here. It's just that they don't have to pay for the costs of fighting. So if they continue fighting as they would here, people are going to die. Dying is bad. The 
society, a country goes further into uh, the depths of war and destroys their economy, just, you know, generally those bad things that happen, it would be better for both sides if the winning side could somehow credibly forgive and institute all of the reforms that they promised the losing side in exchange for surrender. The problem is that, of course, uh, we know that the winning side will not forgive. They'll do the bad things. They'll execute for treason. They'll essentially renege on everything that they promised the losing side that convinced the losing side to give up. So that's the commitment problem. Um, to summarize here, ultimately one side uh, will control the military's, uh, the country's military at the end of the war. So the losing side is going to have to give up uh, control of the the government to the winning side, and control of the government to the winning side means somebody's going to be controlling the military. It's going to be the winning side that's controlling the military, and regardless of the quote-unquote law or of the contract or the negotiation, the settlement, the bargain that's put into place, the side that has the military ultimately is the side that's going to be able to do what it wants to do. So if you're the winner and you control the military, you cannot credibly commit to the terms of a negotiated settlement. You're going to do whatever you want once the other side has given up its arms, which are the only thing that's compelling the winning side to negotiate. Um, once the losing side has given up their military arms, the winning side has no reason to be compelled to uh, commit to its negotiated settlement, so they'll renege on that offer. And thus, even though the losing side knows that it's almost certain to lose, it's still better off continuing to fight despite that fact. And so the reason here that we uh, have less than a fifth of civil wars ending in negotiated settlements is that the terms are just not credible. The sides cannot credibly commit to the terms in the settlement because only one side is going to maintain its military and whatever side maintains its military is going to be the one that reigns supreme and gets to do whatever it wants regardless of what it originally signed on that paper. All right, now we're in the home stretch. We're answering our final question. What makes those 20% of wars different from the other 80%? If you're in the class, you were asked to do a reading by Barbara Walter about what this difference is. Now, before we go into what Barbara Walter said, let us have a public service announcement here. Barbara Walter is different from Barbara Walters. Barbara Walter is a professor at the University of California, San Diego, where I went for undergrad. Uh, Barbara Walters is a media personality who hosts The View and was a former uh, host of the news magazine 2020 and the daytime programming television show, The Today Show. So don't get these two confused. Talk about Barbara Walter if you're talking about political science. Barbara Walter does, well... I'm going to say something vicious, but she does something useful for the world. Barbara Walter just and Barbara Walters just entertains people. Talking about political science, we're talking about Barbara Walter. Drop the S. So what does Barbara Walter say about civil conflict? She says that uh, third-party interventions are critical to successful civil war settlement. She actually calls this the critical barrier to civil war settlement. Now, to give an example of what she means by this, uh, by third-party intervention, let's talk about Iraq. So, in Iraq right now, you have a bunch of Shiite Muslims and fewer Sunni Muslims. So, Sunnis are the ethnic minority, Shia are the ethnic majority. Basically, if the Shia could do whatever they wanted, the Shia would trounce the Sunni Muslims. The Sunni Muslims would not be able to do really much um, to stop the Shia from doing that. They would not be able to have, you know, basic human rights uh, credibly supported by the Shia uh, just because of these population numbers. But um, as it turns out, Iraq, uh, despite how ugly it has been there, is in a relative... Um, relative state of peace and the reason for that is the united states is there so the united states stands in between the shia and the sunni and essentially forced the shia to commit to the promises to uphold uh you know basic human dignity to the sunnis and to allow them um, due process um, in the iraqi political process now of course despite the united states best efforts it's still a mess in iraq you don't want to be living in iraq if you can't help it um but in terms of the grand scheme of things in, in the, the realm of civil conflict, 
the United States is doing at least a decent job of upholding the agreement between these two and preventing massive scale warfare between these two uh, different ethnic groups. But absent the United States, if the United States were to have just left in 2005, what you would have seen is the Shia essentially trouncing the Sunni just like that. The Sunni would be lost from the process and the Shia would essentially be able to abuse um, political power, which would have caused the Sunni to erupt in a uh, civil conflict. And, you know, essentially we saw a lower scale version of what could have been had the United States not been there. So... Barbara Walter very big on this idea of having third-party uh, third enforcement of negotiated settlements to essentially uh, prevent the powerful side, in this case the Shia group, from dominating the weaker side, in this case the Sunni group. Um, so given that, given that third-party enforcement is the key to solving all of these things, you might wonder, well, why aren't all civil wars settled? That is, if we know that third parties can uphold negotiated settlements, then why don't we send third parties to all civil, civil wars? And the answer is that finding an, ex an effective third-party enforcer is not an easy task. And Walter gives three criteria for what makes an effective enforcer, so let's go over those three. Uh, first here, an enforcer must have an interest in a peaceful sell settlement in that country to counterbalance the cost of the enforcement. So if we're going to go, as we did in Iraq, and you know we are spending billions of dollars there, losing thousands of lives, we must be getting something out of that in order for us to uh, actually want to stay there. So an enforcer, in this case the United States and Iraq, must have a, a high enough payoff for... Uh, staying in the country to make it worthwhile for them to pay those costs. But at the same time, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, you must have as an enforcer an incentive uh, to sustain peace in that country, but you must also not be biased in who gets uh, that peace in, in what way. So if if an enforcer really likes one particular side of the conflict and wants to make sure that that particular side is accounted for, the other side might not want that enforcer to go into the country given that they're going to be biased on the other side. And so you might still end up in conflict if you have a biased enforcer in that regard. So it's a little bit tricky and there's a lot of a balance here in that you have to have uh, a high enough utility or high enough payoff for staying and, and and forcing a peace to exist in that country, but uh, you must also simultaneously not be biased toward one side. So that's a bit of a difficult thing there. Um, number two here is that the enforcer must have enough military power to crush a violator. That goes uh, without saying, I think it's, it's relatively straightforward here. If you're a very weak country, say you're Kenya, you can't enforce the peace in Iraq because uh, you can't actually have enough troops there to be able to dissuade uh, the Shia, for instance, from rising up against the Sunnis or vice versa. You just have to be strong enough in order to be able to take care of that thing. And so you're already limiting uh, a lot of countries like that. A lot of weak countries can't be very uh, viable enforcers because they're just not going to be strong enough to crush the strong actors in the particular country that needs uh, to have third-party enforcement. And finally, the enforcer must signal its resolve in a costly manner. So the sides might not believe that this enforcer is actually going to keep the peace when push comes to shove if they're sort of just half-heartedly in it. So you need to, as an enforcer, actually demonstrate that you're resolved in enforcing this, enforcing the settlement by, uh, well, one good example of this is by just to send a lot of troops there. Now, not only does that relate to two here, but it also demonstrates by the fact that you're willing to pay the cost to station a large number of troops in that country that you actually, uh, you actually care about the country and you're serious about enforcing the peace. So those are the three criteria she gave you or she gives you, and uh, that actually wraps up the lecture here. So hopefully now at this point, you can define what a commitment problem is, you can explain why a commitment problem causes uh, civil wars to start, and you can explain why commitment problems uh, make civil wars difficult to end. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, you can ask me in the comments. Take care.